My next guest is former Commerce Secretary Carlos Gutierrez, whom I just mentioned. Secretary Gutierrez served in that position in the George W. Bush administration from 2005 to 2009. Prior to leading the Commerce Department, he was chairman of the board and CEO of Kellogg Company, and that's right, he saved Tony the Tiger. Uh, today, is the co he, he is the co-founder and executive chairman of Empath, a technology startup that uses machine learning to build what they call the workforce of the future. Secretary Gu Gutierrez, great to see you again. Uh, you. Have, have really enjoyed our interactions in the past, and, and, I, and, I, and I remind people of your Kellogg background because I think some people forget that those people who served in high government offices just think about a government frame to things. And I know you were a private sector, one of the best CEOs uh, in the country, uh, saved uh, Kellogg's during a tough time. And so right now we see all sorts of businesses in the United States, large and small, being hit by a bunch of simultaneous shocks. So I'd love to get your dashboard of what do you think we all ought to be focusing on as our most important priorities as we think about exports and we think about the economic vitality and livelihood of business today in America? Well, I think, first of all, as it refers to exports, we need to have a more sensible trade strategy. Our, our strategy today is very emotional. And uh, there's a sense that if we have a trade deficit and someone has a surplus, that they must be taking advantage of us. Um, the reality is that when we have a decline in our trade deficit, uh, it usually means that we are in an economic downturn uh, because there's less commercial activity. So it's very ironic. Um, and it's, and it's uh, just as ironic that today, as we've been in this terrible tariff war for uh, for months and months and months, that our trade deficit is actually up. Our exports have declined more than our imports. So it's not working, but we continue to do it. And we have missed out on some tremendous trade opportunities. We pulled out of trade deals that we should have been in. So we have backtracked, and we're probably five, 10 years behind uh, the rest of the world, and I'm talking about Europe, Asia. So yes, we've we've made uh, uh, we we've made a strategic mistake, and I, I want to say that clearly because I believe that in my heart of hearts. You know, I sometimes try to escape the political stuff in Washington and try to give myself a different frame. And recently, I interviewed the CEO of GoDaddy. Um, uh, uh, Aman Bhutani, and uh, GoDaddy is the largest registrar of domain names in the United States, mainly for e-commerce firms and others. And they have a project called Venture Forward where they, where they uh, can see lots of micro-businesses and ventures uh, uh, being built in the United States, even during a time of crisis like this. In fact, these are oftentimes what he calls side hustles. And so the economic vitality and dynamism uh, is there, and it's not something the government created. It's just it's just happening. And and I'm just wondering, with your business sense and your understanding of both business and government, are there things that the government and the business sector could be doing to help give these new um, green shoots, if you will, of business, you know, a greater stake in in the global scene? Absolutely. Uh, this is uh, actually this is our economy, and it's the future of our economy. Uh, we often talk about the big multinationals. We talk about the stock market as being the best indicator for our economy. Uh, actually, it's the number of new companies that are started up. Uh, that's what makes, that's what gives our economy vibrancy. Because many of those small startups uh, will turn into big companies. Uh, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Ford, those are just some, Kellogg was an example. So uh, we need to embrace that. We need to have incentive sport. We don't talk about it enough. These people are heroes. They, uh, they risk everything and often they fail because startups are, are a risky bet. Um, and those are the real heroes of our economy. And you're absolutely right. In today's world, you can export without having a warehouse. You can export without making anything. 
you can export uh, without really having uh, working capital involved because of technology. And there are firms that facilitate that, that enable a small company in the U.S. to export their products to customers in China. So it is, you know, the world has changed. It's easier to open up a a startup, but there's a lot more competition, so it gets a lot tougher. Let me ask you the same question I asked um, Congressman Larson. Are you worried that that America's um, not being engaged, leaning in on uh, global rulemaking, on you know reticence about the WTO, um, and basically pulling back, at least from a Washington perspective, from a lot of these global opportunities, is going to lock us into a position where? we're not going to have the global middle class buying our products. The global middle class is going to be, you know, outside our kind of uh, territory, if you will. Is that a solvable rift? Well, yes, I am worried. It it is solvable, but it's going to take time. Um, You know, it's not only taking away the tariffs. It's not only uh, abiding by some of the trade agreements, but we have to rebuild trust. Um, uh, You know, we have just about undone the WTO. So a lot of the institutions that we put in place to guarantee fair and free trade are being dismantled by the U.S., which is so hard to understand. Um, This is the system that we created. And I remember as Secretary of Commerce, a big part of my job was convincing countries to adopt this free trade system because it works. Free trade has lifted millions of people out of poverty. Uh, It lifts economic progress. Uh, Just imagine with 5% of the world's population, if we didn't export. And the problem is that if we restrict imports, uh, you can't have it both ways. Your exports will also be restricted. And, and we are a country of exporters. We're a country of business people, of entrepreneurs, uh, of people who see the world as an opportunity. Uh, and that's being taken away by, um, by, by the U.S. government. It's being taken away from companies, which is, you know, five, ten years down the road, we're going to feel it. And, and it's going to be an impact on our economy. Um, And at the same time, the void that we are leaving open will be filled by China. So many of the trade agreements driven today are driven by China. Uh, We were setting the rules, but as we backed away, someone else is going to set the rules. So we have given up a privileged position. We can get it back, but there is a lot of trust that needs to be regained with our trading partners. You probably noticed just a week ago, uh, we put tariffs on Canadian aluminum. Why? Well, maybe it's a good campaign tactic. But to do that to an ally two years into a trade war, it it just doesn't make any sense. So um, it's not only China, but we are fighting with our allies. And you have to ask the question, why are we fighting? If we did this because of our trade deficit, It's not working. Uh, What is happening, though, is that we are losing jobs. Uh, Companies are not as strong as they were. And by the way, the the Chinese are not paying for the tariffs. U.S. consumers and U.S. companies are. So we're just hurting ourselves. And this is just a uh, this is a uh, self-defeating purpose that we have here. Do you think, Carlos, that we failed that, that broadly there was a failure to uh, educate Americans in a more direct way about the benefits. I think a lot of Americans, if you went out and talked uh, to many of my relatives who, who you know, felt like in the choice between President Trump and Hillary Clinton, that Hillary Clinton represented New York, the financial world, which was sort of screwing their interests. They came through the 08, 09 financial shocks. They lost homes and money, and they sort of felt like that kind of capitalism is not helping us. Do we need, and, and, and that we need something else. And, and some, uh, uh, my friend Pat Malloy just sent me a note saying, you know, exports are great, but could we return back to producing stuff in America re- onshore or reshore to think about some of these things, but still uh, be supportive of exports um, so that people feel that there are tangible benefits to them 
from being internationally engaged. And I'm just interested in what you would do if, if you were given that, that responsibility today. I, I think you're right. And I think you make a good observation that uh, really free trade and, and globalization really took off after NAFTA in 1994. Uh, then, of course, China joined the WTO in uh, 2000, 2001. So, you know, in a relative sense, uh, it's still new. It's still a new phenomenon. And there's no question that people have been hurt, especially when you go to communities. Uh, you can't expect people to support trade if they've just lost the only factory in town. Uh, so... We may look at national numbers, and the national numbers tell us that trade is good. But try telling that to the person who worked at a textile factory that was shut down because that moved to Vietnam or it moved to Central America. So I think we do need to adjust. Uh, we need to be more uh, sensitive and have policies that are more sensitive to communities that lose their livelihood. Uh, whether that means government investment, whether that means incent incentives for companies to move there, uh, whether that means helping people retrain, that's going to be the big challenge because we are losing jobs because of technology. Uh, we are losing jobs because it's, it's less expensive to make these products overseas. So what we need to do is retrain our people so that they can take higher value jobs. Mm. Uh, and that's the challenge. We can't just leave people alone. Skills that we have today are going to be obsolete in 24 months. That's how quickly the world is moving. So we need a national program. We need a national program that involves the private sector and the public sector. We need a retraining scheme uh, around the country. We need to give workers the skills that they need to be able to compete in the future. But what we can't just do is say, look, that's life, that's, uh, that's free enterprise, that's the way it works, and good luck. Because we're going to have tens of millions of people out of work without any skills to come back into the workforce. So, yes, I think that's a big issue. And as we think of the future, we can't just leave it to the marketplace. We've got to learn from the past. I, I want to pose a question to you from someone, uh, Hong Fong Fo, who happens to be an international trade specialist at the U.S. Department of Commerce, the place you used to run. And um, uh, Hong Fong asks, what are your rec recommendations um, as a former Secretary of Commerce on how ITA uh, and other trade-related agencies can and should help American goods and services reach the rising middle class in Southeast Asia and globally? That's a big question. But basically... What role should commerce and these agencies be doing today to help create a step up into the global scene? Because I know it's something that was a priority for you before. I'd just be interested to hear what your map of that looks, what should look, what we should be thinking to about say, today. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I used to say that uh, the Department of Commerce is the nation's sales force, and, and they do a great job. And these are real professionals who have a real sense of passion about business and about exporting and about helping U.S. companies. I think that is uh, sort of the spear that, um, that serves as an ambassador for U.S. businesses. Uh, they can't renegotiate a trade agreement, but what they can do is ensure that both sides are living up to the agreement. They spend a lot of time doing that in ITA talking to countries, trade ministers about what was agreed to, what needs to be done to abide. Um, so that is, that, that's part of the day-to-day -day commerce department. But I'll tell you, a lot of companies have been able to export overseas thanks to ITA and the commerce department who are constantly working to break down barriers and to convince countries that trade is good for them. Now, again, the problem now is company, countries push back and say, well, wait a minute, uh, you slap tariffs on us, or you're mm -hmm. slapping tariffs on the whole world, or you're not abiding by your WTO um, agreements. So that makes it even harder. So it's just one more reason why I have so much respect for the Commerce Department folks. Uh, and this must be a difficult time for them because they understand the importance of trade. 
Uh, but it's the U.S. that's sending all these negative signals about trade. Uh, so thank you to the uh, gentleman from ITA, and thank you for everything you do. Um, and you can be sure that if you're telling countries we will be back, this is a temporary detour, uh, you will be right. The U.S. cannot survive or thrive without a vibrant trade policy. Well, I just want to say thank you because I'm glad you mentioned uh, trust. You know, I've been, we're going to have a program that The Hill is going to put on on what does the world look like in trade and global supply chains in a low trust world. And the fact is, it's, it's a messy world. It's a much more bleak yeah. world. And so uh, we're going to be discussing that. I hope, hope you might um, uh, come back. But uh, former Commerce Secretary, uh, Empath Chairman Carlos Gutierrez, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you thank for you saving for Kellogg's. Great pleasure. to be with you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.